<laughs> I've been out of high chairs for a long time now. But I'm, I'm going to try this for a little bit. If I, if I feel the, uh, the urge, I will stand. <laughs> it just, you know, when it comes on you, you can't just be sitting around when like you're up here preaching. We're still dealing with the priesthood of the believers on Wednesday nights. One of the most exciting and most thrilling experience of life is to know that God has placed you and fitted you into a prophetic role in life. That doesn't mean that you become a prophet in the church. It doesn't mean that you are predicting future events and so on and so forth. But the one I'm talking about tonight is the one that has made of all Christian men in terms of the redeemed community of God as fathers and husbands in the house, as prophets of God in the home. You can't expect the church to be more spiritual than the house. How many know that the church consists of families, right. husbands, wives, children? I wish, and probably to a certain degree it is true, that what happens in the church is brought home and influences family behavior and influences ultimately the community to a certain degree. But can I tell you, unless something happens in the house where mom and dad are concerned, or the head of the house, what happens at home is brought to the church. Uh, that's right. That's where the problem is. Yeah. The church as a fellowship cannot be more godly than what the home is. Let me understand that. Amen. You can't. You just you can't. And I know that when we come to church, you know, and like any other place, we go in a public or rare area that we go on our best behavior. We're told, when I was coming up, obviously, like the rest of you, you go to church and you better behave. Amen. How many times your parents tell you that? I'm taking you to church and you better behave or else there'll be a marker, rest in peace, you know, on that, you know. Um, so we were threatened to be good. And sometimes we needed to be threatened in order for it to carry uh, the uh, moxie that we wanted to have, you know, in our lives. But it comes a time where maturity has to kick in. And we have to assume a role. Gentlemen, listen to me closely tonight. It will be very difficult for you to perform in the church what you don't perform at home. You can't be something in the church entity that you're not at home. And I know it's reciprocal, but I think that if we can get a grasp of this, it will change the DNA of any church. Is that if we can get into the flow of the role of that priest, that prophet, and the king at home, get into the role of that at home, it'll automatically carry over into the church fellowship. And then everything changes in that church. <clears throat> if we seek to please God when we're with Christians in the church, it's a good thing. But if that same ardent seeking is not practiced at home, to please God at home, or to please God at work. How can we expect to have an impact in the church? So, I'm submitting this to you tonight because I believe that God wants to raise up men and women of God in this church that are consistent in their Christian walk with God. As we have it in our bulletin, striving for competence in our Christian walk and witness till Christ be formed in us. 
I'm glad this thing swivels. I can go one side to the next. And not put my back out just by twisting on my own. Are you getting the picture of this tonight? It's very important that we get this. How many know that it's in an environment, watch now, in an environment like this, when you come to church, in an environment like this, it's easy to be a Christian. When you come to church, right? When you're surrounded with Christians all around you, it's easy to be a Christian. It's easy to behave good. <laughs> it, it, it's easy to be on your and on your best behavior when you come to church. I mean, what are you going to do? Climb the walls with no ladders? Come on, you know, you know this. And so, this is a good, 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 good uh, insight that I'm giving you today. Like, we come as uh, the strength that we draw from the Holy Spirit while we're here should be transferred into the home in order for us to put into use, into practice in our daily living. Amen. So that, watch now, what it does is, means that what you got on Sunday morning or Sunday night, Wednesday night, Friday, whatever time you came and got, whatever you got, that if it, if it transfers to the house, and then it was real. Amen. Amen. Because when you receive from God, you don't want it to be a, a passing enthusiasm. Right. Just a passing moment in time. You want it to stick. You want it to stay. Because in your hearts, watch now, when you go to the church, for all of us here, when we come to the church and we hear the preaching of the word, which produces faith, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, we learned last night even more. So, so it stirs the heart, and even in our spirit, in, and while we're sitting in the pew while the pastor is preaching, we make unspoken commitments in our hearts, don't we? After we hear the preaching, we come to the Lord's table, we, we just have that silent moment with God, and we say, Lord, I want to be different, I want to change, I, and I want to make that commitment this morning, tonight, whenever that year. You're experiencing God and you and inside of you, you're not writing it everywhere, you're not telling everybody, but inside of you, when you're sitting in the pew and you're hearing the word the Holy Spirit is dealing with you, you're saying, Yes, Lord, that's what I want to do. That's that's how I want to live, and that's that's my commitment, what I want to do. So you'll know that what you have experienced and how you responded to it was real, not just on an emotional basis not just on an emotional caption for a moment, you'll know that it's real because if you can take what you experience in church and bring it home with you and let it live its way out from you, let it work it, let it give it an opportunity to work itself out in you at home, where probably it's the most difficult thing. <laughs> How I many would agree that sometimes at home is probably the most the, the most challenging place to live out your Christian life? Amen. Yeah. I heard I heard a big amen over on the other side. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> The home, why is that? <laughs> because the home, a couple of things, now don't get me wrong. You don't need to go home and start walking on eggshells and hoping you won't offend anybody. Because you know what? If you can't be yourself at home, let's get real, okay? Let's get real. If you can't be yourself at home, right? So it's okay to be yourself at home. Because that's where a lot of steam build up from the day's activities sometimes is released. Amen to that. You know, you know that boss you worked for and you wanted to kill him earlier that day, you bring him home, you want to kill your husband because you felt like you wanted to kill your boss. So were your kids, you know. And so sometimes the home is where you let a lot of steam out. But here's, 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 the, here's the opportunity. Where, wherever the challenge is, is where the opportunity is. Where there's no challenge, tell me, is there opportunity? Where there's no challenge? No. Opportunity only comes when there is a challenge. 
You see, I don't know. Let me talk to you for a minute. I guess I'm doing that, aren't I? How do I know <clears throat> what the level of love is of God that's activated inside of me unless that love is challenged? Because physically, I know what I can do. You know, I can do those curlies, what do you our, call her? Our girls. I, I, I know I got a 22, 24 pound, and I do about 25, 30 of those, and I push ups 30, 40, 50 of those a day. Try to keep myself built up. The other day, a man told me I'm looking younger. Two weeks ago, he said, I'm looking younger. I said, How are you? <laughs> so, when, 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 uh, I, I know physically what my capacity is. Physically, I know what I can. Physically, you know what you can do. You know what your limits are physically. Is that correct? But how do you measure your moral spiritual stature? How do you know what the level of your strength is if it's not challenged? Amen. Amen. And I would submit to you tonight that the home is the place where it can be best developed in you. And at least at home, if you make a mistake, you can apologize for it. And everybody at the house should be mature enough to be able to keep their mouth shut! <laughs> and not put it in the newspaper every time your mother freaks out. <laughs> Don't tell the world! Your husband lost it last week. <laughs> Don't tell the world your kids are stupid. What I say, what, you know what they say about Vegas? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens on a cruise ship stays on a cruise ship. Mm -hmm. And what happens at home stays at home. Amen. All right, so this is the bond that should be at home so that when you've let your hair out and down and, and you, 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 for a few moments of a day or an evening, you lost it. And you said things, did things, maybe you broke a few dishes. Instead of breaking your husband or your wife, you broke a few dishes. Better choice if you want to break something, you know. And so you feel silly. How many have you ever done something after which you felt silly after that? You felt you felt like you did. Yeah, absolutely silly. What times? Yeah. What times? That's it, about 20 minutes ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You, you say something or you do something, you react or act in some measure, you say, come on, where did that come from? Yes, sir, so I didn't know I was capable of that. Mm. You see, we don't know, see, and this is, listen, where your greatest challenges are is where your greatest opportunities are. And so watch now, if you can become the man of God at home, imagine the man of God, you can be in track. <laughs> If you can become the man of God at home, imagine the man of God you can be at work. Now your kids see your weaknesses. They see the cracks in your armor. They see what buttons they can push to get to you. Mm -hmm. And gentlemen, you got to fix those buttons. Because the kids don't keep pushing. Amen. Until you've learned I got to disconnect that wire so you can push on it all day long. <laughs> you will not have that same reaction. Back How many understand what I'm saying? Amen. Same thing with the moms, you know? Same thing with the moms. Now, brothers know where the buttons are, where little sissies are. <laughs> and sister knows exactly where the buttons are for the brother. Uh -huh. And they push, push those buttons. So, this, see, the home is where the good boot camp is, if you will of life is where we are ourselves and if our own family members cannot understand that we're human and that we're capable of, of a slip and a failure that we're you know that we're capable of falling we're capable of a trip we're capable of a momentary lapse of judgment you know if you can't be like that at home and feel secure that you're not going to be 
and driven away from your home just because you're human, this is a plus for you. This is an opportunity because the ones that you have behaved on towards, toward them, are the same ones that behave likewise to you that you have to have grace to forgive them too. Now, what does the Bible say? Love covers what? A multitude. What's that word? Multitude. What? Multitude. More than one. A lot. <laughs> multitude. <laughs> and daily, no less. So love now. Where? Love covers a multitude now. Where's where's that multitude of sin happen more than anywhere else? So I want you to see that home is not intended to be the battleground. It's intended to be the boot camp. It's intended to show an assimilation of life to demonstrate how challenges can be at home. It'll, it'll, it'll teach you to show you how you can address these things and become victorious over them so that if you're in the workplace or at school or at play or on the road, you know, I, I, can I make a, should I cut that off for a minute? Maybe not. Do that and let the world know. Um, the, the past month, I don't know what it's been, Mary, but I'm becoming more impatient on the road as I've ever been in my life. I don't know what it is about me the last Amen. month. Amen to that. Does anybody else have seen that the past month in your life? And for me, have you been that with you? Shame on us. Look at him. The roads See, are getting sometimes hurt. it's at home the challenge. Sometimes it's on the traffic. It's in the traffic on the road. That's a real challenge. It's sometimes. You know what really gets me? Is when the light turns green and you got about eight or ten cars waiting for that first one to move. <laughs> and it sits there. And sits there. And sits there. Now, now, here's the thing. What I really get griping about is that the guy behind them doesn't say anything. Right. <laughs> he right. is as oblivious to reality as the guy who's sitting in front of him. That's and right. the one behind him, they're all like that, the whole lot of them. That's right. Use the horn. Not one of them beats the horn to get their attention. I'm 12 cars behind, and I've got a foot and hand on the horn. Somebody wake up! I've got things to do, places to go, people to see. If you want to sleep, go to bed. If you want to be on the phone, get it out of the car. But don't get in my way, man. And last month, I'll tell you what, I, I've had to pray through in the car. And now even Jameson has his license. It can't even get any worse than this. I mean, what? <laughs> wow. Hey, listen, what? Real people haunt the house. I couldn't help it, Jameson. Hey, that's what it's for. I couldn't help it, Jameson. The horn is there for a reason. I've heard it before. Yeah. <laughs> they do install it for a reason. Thank you. Thank you. Got one person on my yeah, side. Yeah, that's right. That's right. How are you? Having a good time tonight. So you're getting a picture of this now. Between your car, your home, this is, this is where the challenge is, but this is where the biggest opportunity is. And this is how you measure where you are with God. Is in the boot camp, you know. Because in the boot camp, I've never been to boot camp, but you guys who have been military, they'll push you to find out what your limits are. They'll push you to where, if he asks you to do one more thing, you'll lay down and die. I mean, you, they, they know, they know, they push and push and push, especially when you're going to become a seal or a ranger or something like this, right? They push you and push you to the brink of death. So that you can, they can know your limits to see if you qualify to be an actual seal or is that they call ranger in the, in the army? Ranger in the army. Ranger. Ranger. Okay, same thing as a seal, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. What? What? Now, and so all that. I hope I'm helping you to see something here tonight, because. Sometimes, can I tell you, that, that's, I'm, I'm being honest and frank with you. When I had, when I had my four kids in the car, in the station wagon, mm. 
back in the early 70s and throughout the 70s and the 80s. And I was on my way to church on Sunday mornings. I want you to understand. I needed salvation by the time I hit the front door of that church. You want to lay hands on them? Oh, hell yeah. I, I yes. <laughs> I, I needed repentance. I needed an altar. I needed somebody to lay hands on me and cast it out. All right, that's what I needed by the time I got to church. And I had to preach. <laughs> Pastor Stephen said he was an innocent one. And Stephen will tell you the same thing. He's had to come to church on a Sunday morning or Friday night or a Wednesday night to where in the car or prior to that. It were all like that. <laughs> now how is it? How is it that it always happens at home or on our way to church? All right, so I want you to open your eyes tonight that things that God permits to happen or allows to happen is our, our opportunity to help us ascertain where we are. And so these situations that we face, we must not view them as an enemy. We must see the situation as an opportunity. Look at your neighbor and tell them, these are opportunities. Just tell them, these, these are opportunities. Are opportunities. These are opportunities. Yeah, these are opportunities. <clears throat> now, if your wife or your kids give you too many opportunities, <laughs> shall we say they give us sometimes inordinate numbers of opportunities and we have to have the board of education to be brought out of the closet and that will work too so what are we talking about tonight I want to, I, in fact I'll put a couple of notes down here and um, for the fathers to become good prophets in the house I hope I'll get to my notes and see what happens and actually, they're not notes. They're just scripture references. What does the prophet do? The prophet in the New Testament, okay? But in the Old Testament, <clears throat> the prophet was chosen by God and called by God to have a spiritual insight to assess the moral and spiritual condition of Israel to check the barometer, check the thermometer, check and measure a word. That's what a prophet did. He measured the spiritual depth through sonar from God. And he would warn the people of God, stop doing this, and then he would also warn them that if you cease not, you will have some calamity come your way. And your enemies will gain access and gain over you all power and you're going to wonder why I abandon you. I didn't abandon, I never forsake you. God said, you know, it's an eternal covenant so on and so forth. But sometimes God has to allow things to happen in order to get our attention or to, to us to get the attention of ourselves to find out where we are. But the prophet is there to assess the spiritual situation. Old Testament, New Testament, the prophet is there, watch now, very important, to lend wisdom from God in the New Testament. The prophet in the New Testament is to not necessarily forewarn of futuristic nationalistic events. That's, I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I don't know how many books in the past 50 years since TV and church tapes and everything else have been put out that were the last days. I remember it. It's in 1980, 18, 1989. We were in Charleston. And a guy from Florida who worked with Grandpa Claire, his man, he was crippled. He had the crossing switchblade and he was helping Grandpa Claire and all that. He called me and said, get yourself ready. God spoke to a man down here that Psalm 189, this is the year 1999. God's coming this year. This is the end of, read Psalm 89. And John, his name was John. I said, John, you've got to be kidding. Well, he's a prophet of God. I, if I, I, I can take the whole night just to tell you historically how many have come and predicted the end of time. 
they gave the year, the dates, and so on and so forth, even up until recently, you know, since Israel now especially, who's got the, their capital back in Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. <laughs> the New Testament, the, the, the role of the prophet in the New Testament has nothing like the Old Testament. When somebody moves, listen to me, when somebody moves to that in a prophetic, a prophetic mindset, it's because that person has a sense of what God is wanting to do in the hearts of people. What God has wanted to accomplish in their lives. What God wants to perform in that church. What, and let me tell you this, anytime that he teaches and preaches, or I teach and preach, if it's not prophetic, we need to shut up, sit down, lock the door and go. Because we're kidding ourselves. If we don't preach and teach prophetically, in other words, prophetic means that this is what Jesus would be saying if he was here. Amen. That's a prophetic word. It doesn't have to be, let's stay at the Lord. If you will do this, let like, I, I, I could do that. It's not necessary. It could be, and I don't. I, I don't say it's not necessary. It could be, but that's a dangerous road to go down. And even those who give prophecies like that are under the covering and authority of the pastor, and the pastor has the authority to squelch that or encourage it. It's one or the other. The Bible says, "Prophesy one, two, or three by order." And let every prophecy be judged. Okay, so we, we have all the New Testament. But the New Testament, watch now, the New Testament order for prophetic word is to edify, to comfort, and exhort. It is not to predict the future. A prophetic word is there to comfort. Are there things that Stephen and I share with you that comfort you? That's right. Yes. Edify, the same thing. To edify means to build up. Are there things that we say that build you up in your faith? And also to exhort in our ministry of the word. Have we brought an exhortation to you to live in a way that will, will induce the presence of God and the power of blessing God in your life? What do you think we've been preaching here for the last years and years and years? is to get yourself in a, in a position to receive the, the countenance of God, His smile on your life. Get in position yourself for that, especially when it comes to the Lord's table. So those three things that in the New Testament prophecy was used for, we're doing it in our preaching all the time and in our teaching. But New Testament does not predict the future. It, it, we leave that to the, uh, the New Testament prophet by the way, the New Testament prophet is the Holy Spirit. He will show you things to come. Bring back the remembrance left where I've taught you. He will teach you all things. And so on and so forth. But that is, the New Testament prophet is the Holy Spirit. And he deals with us on a very intimate and very personal basis. Let me go back to what I was that was a little sidebar right here. Now, is that a prophet or someone, watch now, who, 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 who moves with prophetic insight to answer a particular need uh, at that moment of the hour, which becomes then a rhema, which is a spoken word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, it's a rhema, that's, that's the testament. Then he is lending, is he not lending wisdom? Isn't that at that moment giving the wisdom of God? How do you know that every word that comes out of the mouth of God is a counsel from Somebody help me. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Is that correct? correct? Every word that comes out of the mouth of God is a word of counsel. What does Revelation 3.18 give us? And I'm just at the top of my head. Let me see if I got the right verse. Check out Revelation 3.18. <clears throat> did you hear me, James? Yeah, I did. It just... Okay, okay. Revelation 3.18. What, does anybody have it? Okay, I counsel you. There's, see, what's it say? What's the second word there? 
I counsel you. Jesus is the great counselor. God is the great counselor. To buy from me gold refined of fire that you may be rich, and white garment that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes that you may see. I counsel you. I counsel you. A prophet in the New Testament gives counsel. Counsel means wisdom. Let's say it together. Counsel means wisdom. So if a husband or a father, it, watch now, if a husband and a father is going to uh, activate his role in the house, he must bring counsel to the house. He must bring wisdom to the house. He must, a prophet speaks of the, as, as though he was speaking the oracles of God. Peter and Paul both said that. Shut up, unless when you speak, it is seasoned with salt, that those that hear you would receive a grace from your mouth and your words. And Peter said, make sure that when you speak, you speak as the oracles of God. That is a word of counsel. A counsel is one that's encouraging. It's an uplift. It is an embrace. It is a sense of edification. One that builds you up in your most holy faith. The Bible says to stir one another up. Well, what do you think the prophet did in the Old Testament? He stirred the people. That's what the New Testament does to each other. Stirring up each other in your most holy faith. Paul counseled Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you that you receive. Okay, so what we're looking at, the husband as a prophet, and the father as a prophet in the house, he is there to give counsel. He is there to give wisdom. process of maturing, in the process of growing up, in the process of developing the role of prophet in the house, dad will make mistakes. Hubby will make mistakes. He's going to blow it from time to time. It's going to happen. Peter denied Christ three times in one night. God restored him. The righteous fall seven times. But the Lord raised him up. It's not how often you fall. It's how often you get back on your feet. Amen. You've got to get back on your feet. And in a family setting, thank God that there is a general wisdom in there, God-given, to where there, love, where there is love, there's a covering of a multitude of sins. Because it has to be reciprocal. So if the wife feels that she has, for instance, a word of wisdom, 